Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming to our second annual UBC Cannabis Convention. I'm really excited to be here. Um, my name is Ted Smith. I'm the president of the International Hempology 101 Society. And uh, today is uh, another uh, convention that, that we've held. Now, uh, we're based in Victoria. In fact, uh, two weeks ago, we held our 13th convention at UVic. Uh, where Hempology, uh, in, in terms of campuses, really uh, started 16 years ago. And we had a, a great week at, at UVic this week. Uh, it's been a bit of a struggle. Um, this year, uh, or sorry, September, a new smoking bylaw came into effect at the University of Victoria, and they actually asked us to move our weekly 420s from the center of campus to outside of what's called Ring Road, near the Student Union Building. And uh, we have a, a weekly 420 there. It's our 13th year. Um, in fact, it's turned into the largest student club on campus. Uh, you may see a postcard at the back. I think we've got one up on our uh, board there. But uh, the weekly 420s, we've had up to 380 students at a, a 420. And often they've been uh, uh, in the hundreds uh, for the last few years. Um, but the move did affect us in different ways, moving outside of the ring road and away from when the classes held. Uh, um, the numbers were smaller, but uh, we countered by actually getting the uh, student society to have what we've called a referendum, but uh, the students actually had a vote this Wednesday during their normal elections for the student body, or student board of directors, and I'm really happy to say we won by a 52% measure, and the ballot was essentially to see if the students at UVic uh, think the 420 tr are, are a traditional part of student life. And now the, the new board of directors that got elected actually has a mandate to tell the administration that a, an exemption needs to be made in the smoking policies for the 420 meetings. And so uh, we're very happy to have the student body endorse the 420s. And it's now essentially you know, forever uh, a tradition of UVic students uh, in, in some ways officially. And so we're very happy to have that victory under our belt, and we hope we can move the 420s back to the center of campus. Now, on that note, we don't have quite the status here at UBC. We're a very new club here. And so if people are going to have a, a puff today because they've got their Health Canada card, right, um, please go outside of the building and smoke where everybody else smokes their cigarettes. We had a huge problem last year where someone with the Health Canada card thought they could smoke in the patio back here where nobody can smoke anything. They're actually assaulted by a security guard who kind of flipped out and there is a lot of sort of heat on this meeting because of the potential for people smoking up where they shouldn't be. And uh, um, the other problem we may actually have is uh, the lack of students here. Now that's not to suggest there's a problem with you folks more our club here. We've actually had a huge problem at UBC this year with uh, the president and, and the executive, except for one, um, uh, basically having a, a bit of a coup and they actually tried to change Hempology 101 into a hemp, or just hemp club, and uh, not talk about cannabis and all the other controversial things. And when the uh, executive uh, didn't get their way, they basically uh, packed up and left. And, we don't even have the list of students that signed up to our club in September and no way of contacting them even about today. And uh, we effectively don't have a, a, an executive, save one, and uh, didn't really get the word out on campus about today's meeting. Next year will be different. In September we have some plans to really engage with the students and unfortunately we just picked a wrong president to start off up here. Uh, but uh, there is a huge potential on this campus when we've done club stays here. It's been very well received. And there are some students here, and, uh, so it's not a, that, that they're not uh, interested, um, but we don't really have that connection. So, um, But I would like to thank you all because obviously you've come much further than uh, the UBC students to be here, with, the, like I say, a few exceptions. Uh, and so uh, thank you for coming. We've got uh, I, I would say one of the best lineups of speakers I've had at any convention, and, and we've had many. Uh, in fact, in two weeks, our next convention's at Vancouver Island University. We have Hempology clubs at the three campuses, and I'll tell you more about the next convention. 
But I also have another great announcement to make before I let Chris get up here. Um, in that uh, Mount Allison University in New Brunswick is actually just starting a hepology club. Actually, a, a club that is in existence now is changing their name and taking on hepology's mandate. We're going to be having conventions uh, in New Brunswick, actually, in November. We're lining up a convention there. So I'm really excited to be uh, in another province with a hepology club that's quite independent of us. And hopefully more will, will start up and we'll be getting more people you know, talking and learning and, and teaching about this incredible plant because uh, uh, I think I'm here and many of you are here today uh, because of this plant and what it can do for us, what it can do for the planet. And uh, it just amazes me the more I learn, and I've been in this for 17 years, uh, the more there is to, to learn and, and to know. And today we have a, a collection of the top uh, researchers in, in the history of cannabis and in the cannabinoids of cannabis and in the activism uh, and, and the work in the field. And, and I'm really excited to have them here and to have them in my life. They're four of my very best friends and I, I love them dearly. So I appreciate uh, what they do uh, in, in every sense. And the first speaker today, Chris Bennett, uh, is uh, someone who, who has uh, led me uh, into uh, areas that I didn't think were possible when I became a cannabis activist 17 years ago. Uh, the idea that, that Moses made an anointing oil out of cannabis was just completely unknown to me. And otherwise, Chris Bennett has dug up facts about this plant and its history that uh, um, have astounded many of us that work in the field and, and I think uh, would be hard to swallow for those outside of it. But certainly, uh, his research into cannabis and, and the Bible and uh, his recent work with uh, the Soma Solution, uh, Chris has, has uncovered secrets and, and turned heads uh, in, in the history of this plant. Uh, but uh, today, I, I really wanted Chris to focus. He's, Chris has spoken at almost every single convention I've done. So if you want to see some of his past talks, uh, um, you can check him out on YouTube. We're filming it today. I don't know if we're getting our live stick and working, but we're certainly going to film this, put it up Jay's on YouTube. He's on the way. Um, He'll be here soon. Okay. And uh, uh, Chris is actually speaking again in two weeks uh, from now um, as well. And so uh, we're pleased to have him speak here again. And today he'll focus actually on hemp, which is uh, critical to the survival of this planet, I would like to say. And so I'm really excited to, to learn what Chris has done up about uh, the, the hemp plant. And uh, we have some of his books over there. I got my old copy of uh, Green Gold, if you want to see. Uh, uh, that and uh, otherwise, uh, please, Chris, come on up and thank you so much again. For Chris. Thank you. Well, I'll probably talk more about cannabis and hemp in conjunction because, on that sum, I don't like to split it up. And in the ancient world, it was kind of a versatile plant that was growing for uh, uh, both properties, and it wasn't until much later that real distinctions uh, grew up with regarding you know, fiber plants and drug plants and all that type of stuff. That all came much later. You know, you can you can grow good quality cannabis from from a hemp crop. You just have to look to Mexico and South America and to take a look at what indigenous fiber crops uh, did under the right environment in producing plants like Acapulco Gold and things like that. Um, you know, generally when we think about the history of cannabis, most people's minds go back to the 60s or maybe uh, with the hippies and stuff like that, or maybe the 30s with the Jazz Age and stuff like that. Uh, um, but uh, um, the more general fact among scholars and stuff like that is that cannabis is actually one of our oldest ag agricultural crops. In fact, Carl Sagan uh, believed this to be the case. He used the pygmies in Africa as an example of this. The pygmies were basically hunter-gatherers until they began planting cannabis, which they used for ritual purposes. In the minds of the pygmies, they had been using cannabis since the dawn of time. It was a gift from God to them. And you know that probably has more to do with the pygmy's conceptualization of time, because uh, agriculture and the seasons involved in the agricultural cycle really led in a large way to the concept of time and uh, 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 linear time in, in a way that, that wasn't so much for our hunter-gatherers, which were more caught up in the you know just day-to-day -day existence. Um, so you know it goes way, way back. And uh, um, in, in regards to archaeological evidence of this. Uh, um, uh, fiber cannabis has been found going back 10 to 12,000 years in Taiwan. 
And so we know that there they were already growing. But it's even thought to go even further back than that. Elizabeth Whalen Barber, who's probably the foremost uh, textile, Asian textile expert in the world, uh, points to tools found that were like 25,000 to 30,000 years old that were used for the decortation of hemp. And so this puts this way, way back into the time of uh, what's known as the Great Leap Forward. And this is a time period where humanity uh, came up with the uh, basic skills for tool making, uh, fire, all these types of things like that. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, it really started to excel in a way which we hadn't before. We stopped being merely uh, uh, the primates of the jungle and started taking on uh, uh, the basic beginnings and roles of civilization. Uh, top researchers in the field in the study of cannabinoids, which is, uh, uh, you know, cannabinoids are in cannabis, but we also have endocannabinoids in our body. That's why cannabis is able to affect us in, 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 in the ways that it does as a medicine and also psychoactively, have postulated that plant-based cannabinoids ingested by aged man may have been responsible for prehistoric man's great leap forward. Doctors John McPartland and Jeffrey Guy, and these are the guys from GW Pharmaceuticals, in their fascinating paper, The Evolution of Cannabis and the Coevolution with the Cannabis Receptors, a hypothesis, postulate that a plant ligand, such as the cannabinoids of the hemp, the hemp plant, may exert sufficient selection pressure to maintain the gene for a receptor in an animal. If the plant ligands improve the fitness of the receptor by serving as a proto-medicine or a performance enhancing substance, the ligand receptor association could be evolutionarily conserved. And I quote from their paper here. In a hunter-gatherer society, the ability of cyto cytocannabinoids to improve smell, night vision, discern edge, and enhance perception of color would improve evolutionary fitness of our species. Evolutionary fitness essentially mirrors reproductive success, and cytocannabinoids enhance the sensation of touch and the sense of rhythm, two central responses that may lead to increased replication rates. You know, it's important this to remember that cannabis cross-culturally in the age of world is regarded as one of the most potent aphrodisiacs. Some authors have proposed that cannabis was the catalyst that synergized the emergence of syntactic language in Neolithic humans. Language, in turn, probably caused what anthropologists call the great leap forward in human behavior when humans suddenly crafted better tools out of new materials, fish hooks from bones, spear handles from wood, rope from hemp, developed art, painting, pottery, musical instruments, began using boats and evolved intricate social and religious organizations. This rather abrupt transformation occurred about 50,000 years ago. This recent burst of human evolution has been described as epigenic, but beyond our genes. Could it be that due to the effect of plant ligands, cannabis, cannabis cannabinoids, you know what I mean? And so uh, the, the, the adjustment of cannabinoids caused, caused uh, novel thought. That's why you see it in so many artistic uh, type of endeavors. So many writers have been involved with cannabis. Even people like Shakespeare have been reputed to have been cannabis users. Dante, other, other well-known, uh, you know, some of the greatest writers of the 19th century. And this all has to do with the, the creative uh, process that cannabis does and makes people take a look at a situation in a totally new novel way that you weren't doing in your sober mind. Um, and uh, um, in, re in regards to ingesting cannabis, archaeologically, the oldest evidence we have of that is, is about 5,500 years old. This actually comes from the Ukraine region. And they found there that uh, um, they're burning uh, centers that were used for burning cannabis in caves. So this is like 3,500 years before Christ. People were burning cannabis. This is also uh, uh, the ancestral land of the Proto-Indo-Europeans. You know, many of our cultures and our languages come from the Indo-European language, but this is the homeland of the Proto-Indo-Europeans. And these people were the first to domesticate the horse. And it's believed that it was through the production of hemp fiber ropes that they were able to grab horses and, and uh, uh, maintain them and, and, and domesticate them eventually, you know, changing human, human culture forever and causing the spread of, of, of uh, the beliefs of these people and their language to go up throughout the ancient world. Uh, um, and like, uh, um, you know, these Proto-Indo-Europeans, they went up into China, like, like about 4,000 years ago, and existed there until about three or 400 years. They went into India, into Persia, in, 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 into uh, Europe, and many of our English language, uh, cannabis is related to the uh, Sanskrit bomb uh, um, because of the A-N of the word. And this is true of the Dutch canvas, the French Chambra, all these words come from a, a, a earlier language, the Indo-European language. So this goes right back to the very beginnings uh, of linguistics and stuff like that. Cannabis, the root term for it, canna, is thought to be of the oldest sort of rootstock known in language. So that's how 
in depth and, and integrating our existence has been with this plant. So uh, um, it's, it's, it's entrenched in human culture. And uh, um, in, in Europe, uh, it's thought that, uh, um, as the members of the exhaustive encyclopedia of Indo-European culture have noted, there are at least three chronological horizons to which the spread of hemp might have been ascribed. The early distribution of hemp across Europe during the Neolithic period, 5,000 BC or earlier, so 7,000 years ago, there were already chronic hemp fiber in Europe. Uh, a, a later spread of hemp for presumably narcotic purposes around 3,000 BC. And they found uh, evidence of cannabis at Druid sites, and Celtic sites, uh, um, all throughout this whole region, in, in Germany, France, in, in, in England as well. Uh, um, or, and, and, and then still later, a spread or at least pre reemergence of hemp in the context of textiles during the first millennium BC, so it returned again as a big textile that was used there. And they point to uh, pottery from uh, Europe uh, called corded ware pottery. And this, these are clay vessels that have the impressions of cords pressed into them. And one of the top anthropologists and archaeologists, Andrew Sherratt, believed that this was uh, a vessel that was used for holding an intoxicating beverage of cannabis in Europe. And he pointed to poppy-shaped vessels that were used to hold poppy-type uh, uh, preparations and said that these hemp, hemp uh, cording coordinations in these particular vessels connotated that this was used for a hemp beverage. And this was used you know, throughout, they find this stuff all through, throughout the ancient world. Um, and then, um, and, and, and so, so, so all through Europe, you know, and then, and then China is equally as old. You know, China was thought to be, we used to be called the land of mulberry and hemp. And, and, thought by some, and it's thought by some botanists to be the original home of undomesticated cannabis. In Asia, hemp use dates back to as far into the Stone Age, with hemp fiber imprints found in pottery shards in Taiwan, just off the mainland China, were over 10,000 years old. Alongside these shards were found long, rod-shaped tools, similar to those used in mainland China in later times to decord hemp, as well as indicating its use in popularity throughout the intervening millennia. The famous terracotta warriors were equipped with hemp-soled shoes uh, before they're long soldiered into terra firma. Uh, as such, it's not surprising the Chinese were amongst the first people to discover both the medicinal and magical properties of the planet, with a history of use in these cases, along with, with a food fiber and oil syrup for, for lighting the paints going back thousands of years. Shen Nang, uh, an ancient emperor of China's uh, Hen Tzu, thought by some to be as old as 2700 uh, uh, years BC, uh, prescribed cannabis for a variety of medical uses. Medical uses identical with, uh, with those used today. And uh, um, it was also thought to be one of the uh, uh, main elixirs of immortality. And you know what they're finding out about these antioxidant qualities of cannabis and, and, and these other things indicate that it may be, uh, play a role in longevity. In fact, the oldest woman who ever lived, Pula Nayak in India, who lived to be about 128, used cannabis every day and prescribed her own long life to, to the use of cannabis. And throughout the ancient world, you know, in, in, the, in the Vedic texts, uh, in China, in, in, in the Persian texts, that there's references to cannabis where they believe that it actually caused people to live a lot longer, you know? Um, and uh, it, it was also used, the paper originates in China around 105 AD. Uh, um, so that was another major uh, uh, cultural evolutionary step, the production of paper moving away from papyra and uh, clay tablets and things like that, as well as anesthesia for operations. They used to use hemp-infused wine uh, to knock people out uh, for operations. In fact, cannabis-infused wines were used throughout the ancient world, uh, in Greece, Persia, uh, all throughout. It was a really common way of, uh, of ingesting cannabis. And also in China, I mentioned earlier that some of these Indo-European uh, individuals ended up in China, and this is the Gushi culture. And we now only uh, only found out about this culture recently through uh, the discoveries of my, uh, mummies in, in central China. And there was found with one of these mummies, 2,700-year-old female cannabis that was specifically grown for its intoxicating purposes, all just female, no male plants whatsoever. And this was good quality herb. In fact, it's so well preserved, you can smoke it probably still. Ethan Russo, a, a doctor I know, uh, um, did the study on this cannabis, and it was still green, and you can see the crystals on the plant and stuff like that. And this uh, culture is thought to have gone into China from about, about 2000 BC, and they were kind of pushed down around 400, 300 BC. 
but uh, it's changed our uh, China's concept of of how they develop. You know, Chinese in China, the, the the main party line is that they actually evolved from a different. Uh, uh, they didn't go back to Neanderthals and Cro-Magnon. They re evolved from Peking man, a different uh, uh, member of the primate to human family. And so they they believe that their whole culture evolved independently. But now through the, the, the discovery of this culture, they're having to take a, a look at things like bronze making, horse, horseback riding, and things that the Chinese believe they developed independently. And they're finding that the Chinese words are actually borrowed from the Indo-European dialect. And so this indicates that there was these Indo-European uh, um, people that, that, that brought these to it. Um, eventually, the, you know, it, it, and, and this was around the same time that, that cannabis was really big with Taoists in China, and they were using it to talk to spirits and uh, uh, all sorts of things, and, you know, in kind of a shamanic uh, uh, extent. And this was all seen as kind of a foreign influence by the ruling class in China, and eventually it was excised and then just kind of played a role as a fiber plant and a seed for food and that type of stuff. Um, it also has changed our concept of things like the Silk Road. That was thought before this divine, this uh, uh, a particular archaeological discovery, that the Silk Road uh, started about 105 uh, BC, but now because of this find and the evidence of uh, 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 materials and things that, that it's produced, uh, um, and, 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 and which show that this, this culture was in uh, extensive trade throughout the ancient world and through Persia all the way into India. Uh, um, that the Silk Road now was thought to have opened up around 1800 BC or something like that. And it was as much a hempen highway as the Silken Road. Uh, um, and it was a major uh, uh, source of exportation throughout the whole region. So this is uh, um, this discovery of cannabis at this site, uh, these Indo-Europeans in China, has totally revolutionized our concept of history and the spread of civilization. Um, uh, you know, and, and we can see the influence of the, this culture even into places like Greece and stuff. There's references to Nepenthe, a cannabis-infused wine thought by many people. Uh, Democritus, uh, he referred to a cannabis-infused wine. Uh, um, and also at Greek sites assort, uh, associated with the oracle, they found archaeological evidence of hashish. Uh, um, so this is the idea of the uh, Pythia, the Oracle of Delphi, inhaling fumes and stuff like that may go back to psychoactive properties. And uh, um, a similar use was, you know, is, is known in Mesopotamia, you know, in Syria, Babylonia. Cannabis as a medicine was totally widespread, again, for many of the same ailments uh, that we're facing today, things like glaucoma, epilepsy, skin problems, skin diseases, all these types of things that we're just kind of rediscovering cannabis was used for, but it was also a major part of the religious rite in, in, in the ancient world. Uh, the king Ashurbanipal left uh, 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 recipes for hashish that are from 8900 BC. His son Esarhaddon, also uh, 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 um, tablets from his time, refer to the use of cannabis specifically in temple rites. And there's even engravings uh, where they talk about a preparation containing cannabis being used topically to open one's ear to God. And that's again, you know, kind of brings back to uh, 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 the whole biblical use, which I'll get into a little bit later. Likewise, in Egypt. In Egypt, there's evidence of hemp fiber going back like 3000 BC. They found a hemp fiber ball that was from 3000 BC. And uh, um, there's uh, um, a wide use of topical preparation for cannabis uh, for a variety of ailments, uh, uh, vaginal ailments, skin disease again, uh, these types of things. And then there's also uh, references to cannabis infused wines, uh, analogs to the hemp. And they've actually found uh, Egyptian amphora from about 1500 BC, these were uh, clay wine bottles that have evidence of cannabis infused wine again. Um, and then there's the Kaifi incense, which was a major part of uh, Egyptian social and religious rite, but that many scholars believe contained cannabis as well. Um, and uh, um, this even flooded into the Hebrew system, and we uh, uh, Ted mentioned briefly Moses. And uh, you know, this is really fascinating. When I was writing my first books, I came across the work of uh, this uh, etymologist and anthropologist known as Sula Bennett, who said there were these Hebrew references uh, to Kenna and Kenna Bossum that were references to cannabis. And this is, again, goes back to these Indo-European words uh, 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 that designating cannabis that I referred to earlier, the, the earliest term, canna. This is the Hebrew equivalent of that, and it shows that the Hebrew use of cannabis was adopted from uh, Indo-European sources, such as the Thith Scythians, which were horseback riding nomads who spread the use of cannabis throughout the ancient world. We know this 
because of archaeological discoveries of Scythian tombs where braziers that were used for uh, heating up rocks which were placed inside tents and then cannabis was placed on these rocks and they basically vaporized the cannabis with inside a tent. Uh, Herodotus, the famous Greek historian, wrote about this and then it was later discovered at uh, uh, sites, Scythian tombs, along with the artifacts uh, used for the, the ingestion of can the cannabis and the burnt cannabis seeds left over from this process and, and documented that this was the actual case and we know the Hebrews were in contact with the same culture. And uh, um, Sula Bennett pointed to these five references of cannabis. The first of these appears in Exodus 30, 23. And God, who appears in flames of fire from within a burning bush, commands Moses to make this holy and anointing well with about six pounds of cannabis, some and cinnamon. And then he's to go inside the tent of the meeting, place some of this on the altar of incense, burn it, and he speaks to the Lord in the pillar of smoke over the altar of incense. Now, uh, um, I think that this material, in many ways, regarding cannabis and the origins of religion is much more in-depth than this. You know, it goes into India, uh, the, you know, like uh, uh, the Lord Shiva in India, who's thought to be the oldest continually worshipped God on earth, is a lord of cannabis, you know. So this is like entrenched throughout the whole Asian world in Taoism, uh, even in Sikhism uh, much later. It has a heavy cannabis influence through the Nihang Sikhs, which also use cannabis as a sacrament. Uh, um, uh, in Judaism, you have these Kanabasa references. So all of these ancient world religions were all influenced by this. Somehow, when cannabis was used in their rites and in their temples and stuff like that, the gods spoke a little clearer. Um, and, uh, um, and so um, this goes back to uh, um, the evolution of consciousness. And this is why I think that this information regarding cannabis' origins uh, in, in the world's religions and, and, and its relationship to how those developed is as much a threat to fundamental religion as Darwin's theory of evolution was to the myths of Genesis. And I say this because what these reveal is the evolutionary origins of, of these religious traditions themselves and also human consciousness. There's a psychologist, who, uh, Julian Jaynes, who uh, has a well-known theory. It's called The Origins of uh, Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And in a nutshell, Jaynes' idea was that thinking as we do in our inner brains uh, was an evolutionary step that took place after the development of language. We can see elements of language in the animal world. Coyotes, whales, uh, birds, all these types of things have sounds and symbols. It doesn't necessarily designate that they're having deeper thoughts like, I think, therefore I am. And James's view was that this was an evolutionary step that took place around beginning around 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, where people started to hear this inner dialogue. And this consciousness was experienced in much the same way that a schizophrenic experiences consciousness as coming from outside of themselves. And uh, James believed that uh, this can be kicked in at times of upheaval by throwing yourself in a dark cave and different things, and then the voice of the head would kind of start. Terence McKenna, as probably uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, the famous uh, mycologist and entheobotanist, uh, added to this by saying, well, psychoactive plants play a role in this as well. And this goes back to why cannabis was used in religious rituals, is because it actually facilitates that type of activity in the human brain with its uh, receptor sites in the area of higher thinking and memory. Uh, many people you know, might associate this with a type of paranoia or some sort of stimulated activity and they're uncomfortable with that. Or it might even, uh, uh, um, somebody predisposed to schizophrenia is a widely held belief uh, by many anti-cannabis uh, propagandists that, that cannabis may play a role in, in, in bringing out that schizophrenia that's already within that person. And that is kind of how consciousness starts in the human species, according to James. And so uh, this takes away of the idea of, say, Moses being inside the smoky tent of the meeting and the Lord God coming down and saying, don't do this and don't do that, as kind of uh, developing on Moses' own inner uh, psychology, looking at the troubles of his tribe and, and his situation and thinking and pressing that out and the smoke of the herb bringing forth that thought in a new and profound way. And this also accounts, could account for why religion kind of starts popping up systematically over the same few thousand year span in all these different areas, and the gods are saying different things leading to situations like we have now in the world and our global situation in the Middle East and stuff like that. Um, it seems like a pretty good place to kind of cut it off and take some questions, I think. Here we go, a question. 
<laughs> okay. Where'd it go? I was, oh. Okay. Oh, how is China doing with hemp right now? Just you well, the China produces, like, uh, oh, hemp yes. production in China had uh, 20 years ago or so, had almost completely disappeared except for one province. And it was actually uh, a Chinese businessman here in Vancouver that really kind of kicked it back into gear, Alex Shum, and he started importing uh, hemp shirts and getting hemp, hemp cloth produced. Uh, now it's a little more widespread, but uh, not any, you know, mostly just for, for fiber. Whereas in Canada, most of the hemp grown is grown for seed production uh, because we don't have the facilities here to produce any fiber. You know, it would take a, a million dollars of infrastructure uh, in mills and, and that type of thing uh, that would have to be built in order to create an actual workable fiber industry here in Canada. Whereas in China, they had some of that technology and they've been improving on it in the last couple of decades. Yeah, it'd be nice to see some more. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, yeah, it's such a I great, great piece of paper. Yeah, it's still the same. Uh, we have mentioned a lot of medicinal uses for cannabis for like now mainstream medicine would not uh, probably agree with. I mean, uh, uh, over here, you know, they're very disturbing. But here in the chat. Yeah, well, there is research done. You know, one thing is, is with research is the, the inability to patent what you research. And uh, a lot of cannabis research is held up by the inability to patent some of the natural elements in cannabis. They want to find a way to mimic it or reproduce it synthetically in a way to patent it in order to profit on it. And so that's one major hold up in a lot of uh, cannabis research. But there is a lot of research taking place, nonetheless, particularly uh, regarding uh, the ability to fight cancer. You know, it's thought that uh, cannabis can reverse the growth of tumors if applied in the right way. And, and there's growing evidence of this. You know, you know, if you Google things like cannabis and brain cancer, cannabis and breast cancer, cannabis and testicular cancer, uh, you'll find recent uh, papers written on these subjects that are, that are quite in depth and go into detail on how the cannabinoid system is, is working with the with the body. Dr. Harvey's probably better to talk to you, something like that. For me, that's great. Uh, I came across a story on the internet one time about Christ and the anointing oil. Yeah. And apparently there's a formula there for using cannabis in the oil. And it's not even loading up. said that they would smear it on, he would smear it on himself, and the disciples smeared it on himself, and that was to pick a lot of people off. Yeah, well, I, of course, I've written about that in my books, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of the perpetrator of that. But that goes back to this uh, anointing oil in Exodus. Uh, um, and uh, those who received this anointing oil, first just the priest class, and then later the Hebrew kings, were known as the Messiah. And that means the anointed one in Greek. This was translated over into Christ. And in the early Christian period, uh, um, you know, for the first few centuries A.D., uh, there were all sorts of diverse Christian groups, many of them now known under the collective name of the Gnostics, uh, but this refers to a variety of Christian groups. But one of the uh, main uh, uh, differentiations between the group we know as the Gnostics and what became the Roman Catholic Church, which is where all modern Christianity springs from, uh, um, and which didn't really start to really take hold until a uh, two, three hundred years after after the time of Christ, was the use of this anointing oil versus water baptism. And I rediscovered Gnostic texts from the period. They say specifically there's only water in the baptism, but there's fire in the anointing oil. And through the anointing oil, we're initiated to unfading bliss. Gnostic texts also refer to Jesus giving the disciples unguents and uh, 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 um, edibles and incenses uh, um, to heal the sick, saying that you have to heal the body first before you can heal the spirit. And even in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, uh, Mark, uh, John, you know, Luke, and uh, Matthew, uh, um, in, in, the, in the oldest of the, uh, the, the, the Synoptic Gospels, uh, Mark, uh, Jesus doesn't baptize any of the disciples in any of those Gospels, but he does send out the apostles with oil to cast out demons and heal the sick. And casting out demons in the ancient world often just meant treating epilepsy, uh, because that was thought to be uh, demonic possession up until the Middle Ages probably still is in places like the deepest, darkest regions of Africa and, and, and places like that. And so th there's like uh, uh, many references in the Gnostic texts 
to the uh, conflict about this anointing oil versus water baptism. And then on the other side of the coin, the uh, ancient Roman Catholic Church fathers were condemning the Gnostics for their use of secret sacraments. And a lot of this led to the Dark Ages where human knowledge levels went back to the Stone Age and pretty well everything except the Latin versions of the Bible were for pro prohibited literature, you know? So, uh, um, and, you know, and, 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 and this kind of all, the situation also kind of reemerged with the uh, witches and stuff in the medieval times where they were also using top of preparation sometimes containing cannabis and, some, and often in conjunction with much more powerful narcotics like handbane and datura and things like that, but also using in kind of shamanic rituals and stuff. And topicals are coming back to the yeah, yeah, well, yeah, for sure. They, you know, like topical preparations of cannabis, most of the Egyptian medicines were topical preparations. And it was also topically used a lot in this area of Babylonia. There's there's a, a lot of information on that. I wrote a, a paper on topical preparations you can find online. I just can't remember uh, the title of it offhand. Was there any history of uh, like the uncarboxylated raw form being topically common? Um, yeah, I think it was at least dried. I don't know that it would have been cooked in every instance. You know, it was used in poultices and stuff. And I don't think they would have like. Uh, heated it in those types of situations. Even for like arthritis and topical preparations like that, you know. You can make a pretty reasonable, like the, the biblical formula, in addition to cannabis, had uh, myrrh and cinnamon. And uh, Dr. Ethan Rutho believes that that may have caused the blood to react to those kind of heating up chemicals and opened up the body and pores and stuff like that to it. I think you'd have to use an awful lot of topical cannabis to get a psychoactive effect. But to any effect, even a mild one, uh, would have been built upon with ritual and, and stuff like that. But even with the Gnostics, there's evidence of incense and uh, drink and preparations of cannabis. I heard uh, Jack Ferrer used to holding anointing oil all over his legs, he had a real big problem. Yeah, yeah, he, he, then they found a lot of relief from that. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I also uh, have known people that have arthritis in their hands. You know, if it's just a thin layer of skin, it can kind of reach the pain a little bit easier. It'd probably be harder for something like hip pain or something like that. But at least in your hands, where the skin's quite thin over the bones and stuff like that, people can find a lot of uh, a, a lot of healing power in top with prepared cannabis. Mm -hmm. uh, through you, I found out that uh, mm -hmm. the places like mm -hmm. and India have to do a little bit more. Uh, they they have been it's stopping holy man and, and people that worship Shiva for uh, smoking for the uh, Since you mentioned that it's been there for ages, what do you think they're doing this? Now? Well, it's Western pressure, you know, like, you know, uh, 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 rituals like the Kumbha Mela, that's like thought to be the longest continually going human gathering in, in the world. And this is uh, largely based around cannabis mythology. Uh, um, it goes back to a myth of, uh, of, uh, of the gods uh, where Shiva insults Indra, uh, who is the king of the gods. He brings down a curse on all the gods and all the three worlds, including Earth. And everything starts going in decline. And they're like, oh no, what are we going to do? And uh, um, uh, the gods uh, go to Brahma and tell him what's happened. And he goes, oh, he insulted Indra. And this is what's happening. So what you got to do is you got to get potent herbs throw them in the ocean of milk, and churn it with a mountain called Maru, and from that will reproduce the Soma elixir. And when they were doing this ritual, some of the drops fell onto the earth, and in each one of these spots, cannabis grew, and these are the, the places the Kumbha Mela is thought to have originated. And so sadhus in India, devotees of Shiva, partake of cannabis in honor of this event, then and then Shiva Ratri. Uh, um, and so this has been going on for a thousand years, but it's all Western pressure. Same thing happened in the like uh, 19th century when Europeans really started uh, coming into India and the British Raj was there. Uh, um, the, the sadhus uh, of, of, the, of the Hindu religion and then also the fakirs of the Islamic religion were kind of rabble-rousers and they really had the hearts of the people behind them. And they would often question the British Raj, be rude to them, show them no respect. And so uh, the way that they reacted, it was hard to just kind of go out and arrest these people because it was all intertwined with religious life there, uh, is that they started coming up with this medical designation that they were crazy from cannabis use. And there were all sorts of uh, uh, insane asylums growing up. There's a book, uh, Cannabis, Colonialism, and Madness. Uh, um, and, and it's all about how the British Raj and other Europeans were going around and rounding up all the rabble-rousers for cannabis use and throwing them in these insane asylums. And uh, um, you know what's happening here again is it's all about you know with Nepal 
For instance, uh, hashish was legally uh, uh, sold, and other cannabis products were legally sold there up until like 1974, I think it was, uh, when the King of Nepal reversed all that. And this is all due to UN pressure, American pressure, that type of thing. And this has, uh, uh, it's a, although it's a, a, a Eastern European culture, it has an image of Shiva with his bull Nandi on one side, and then the other side, it has a Shifian, Scythian king with dreadlocks, a serpent around his neck, holding a trident, and uh, they totally embrace the indigenous culture because of the cannabis use and the commonality of that. Um, and so uh, this is like from 200 mm -hmm. uh, AD. It's even thought that Buddha was a Scythian, uh, um, and uh, um, the, the Hindu religion itself was brought in by Aryan invaders, these Eastern Europeans that came in with cannabis and stuff. Um, and uh, in Buddha, in the tradition of Buddha, Buddha subsists, uh, you know, like a going, this goes back to texts, I don't know, from about 500, 400 BC. Uh, 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 there's uh, stories of Buddha subsisting on one hemp seed a day during his contemplation under the Bodhi tree. Uh, um, and uh, then, you know, having his, his, his revelation, which led to Buddhism. Um, so, yeah, it, it goes, goes way, way back there for sure. What we know of how the alcohol prohibition kind of went down and the way cannabis is being thought in the same way, um, what do you think some of the possible outcomes are in comparison? Well, you know, I think you take a look at what's happened in the U.S. Alcohol prohibition in the U.S. went state by state. Uh, um, and that's kind of what's happening with cannabis prohibition there, state by state. I think it's what, 14 or 15 or more. Uh, uh, states that you know have medical marijuana there, and there's other states you know there's been you know close votes on legalization and stuff like that. So I think that that's really you know uh, um, what it is, and, and the federal government seems to be fighting that process tooth and nail all the way. Um, you know, probably some of the biggest down the states that we saw from the last California initiative, Prop 19. Some of the biggest opponents were like the prison industry and the prison guard unions and stuff like that. And uh, um, these guys count on prohibition to fill these private prisons. And that, these private prisons are lobbying up here in Canada. It may well turn out that the omnibus crime bill has been influenced by the private prison industry lobbying the Harper government. Wouldn't surprise me a bit. There's growing evidence of that. One last question. Uh, thanks for coming out and giving this talk. Hey, you bet. Um, the, uh, I've been reading a little bit about the uh, <coughs> groups of countries in South America that are fighting against the uh, U.S. war on drugs, right? Yeah, Evo Morales, Hugo Chavez, those guys? Yeah, yeah, the whole thing all the way from Peru right up, uh, right up to the, some countries in Central America. And, um, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of thought, or thought anyways, uh, if not knowledge, direct knowledge, uh, the CIA is the world's largest drug dealer, right? So, you know, ergo uh, guarding uh, crops in Afghanistan is the means to fund the, the terrorism around the world. But um, um, I, I wonder is, is, because this is being dealt with as a purely political issue, and as you say, there's prison industries that are influenced, but there's also the entire legal and accounting for uh, taxation issues to be dealt with as well because everybody caught with what six plants or something like that yeah. take your house and, and everything else right so uh, oh yeah well the, you know the forfeiture laws in the states have totally corrupted uh the, the, the police forces down there and there's been accounts of people taking evidence just so they can seize their homes and their property and their wealth uh, even, even to the result of killing people that were completely innocent, you know, and uh, uh, court cases have, have, have been won based on that, you know. And uh, that same type of motivation takes place here. You know, that type of court picture goes back to the witch trials and stuff, and it puts uh, a desire to look for, for, for people to, to bust that shouldn't be there. Yes. Okay, well, thank you so yeah, very much. Humanity has a natural right to, to the plants of the earth. It's like our right to air and water, you know? And when we're talking about a, a plant like cannabis, we're talking about an indigenous human relationship that goes back 25,000, 30,000 years or further, and that there's a law against this plant and the situation with it is completely unnatural. Thanks very much.